Yeah, sorry, let's continue now. So you should have shared goals and predefined timelines. Goal should be achievable. Having uh, a unachievable goal or difficult to achieve goal in the initial phase of your project should be avoided. What you can do is you can increase the complexity level or you can, uh, you know, increase uh, or decrease the time taken over the period of time, maybe in the next iteration. Initial iteration should be easier and achievable in due time. Short term goal, never create a timeline like in Scrum, for example, we do not set a timeline or a sprint which is more than three weeks. OK, four week is still a very pretty high. Three week is OK, why? Because having a too big timeline or sprint is discouraged in agile. People tend to keep things for the last, which affects the training, uh, the overall schedule, delivery schedule and uh, all the iterations. So they should be small and achievable and all the requirements should be clearly well defined. Shorter timelines have advantages like you can change the priorities if you want. Priority change or you can change the sequence if you want. You can probably just, uh, you know, kind of uh, go and uh, make the changes to your plan, like a particular feature which was about to be implemented in next iteration. You can postpone it for the next to next iteration. OK, something like that. There will be also reduced delay between doing the work and getting the feedback if your pipelines are short ones. Uh, sorry, if your timelines are short ones, not pipeline. Easier to keep organization support when positive outcomes are apparent. Choose the right project. OK, fine. You have chosen a team. Now, which project should I choose as my pilot project for implementing DevOps? Now, there are two different types of project. OK, one is greenfield project and the other one is brownfield project. Have you heard the terms before? Greenfield or brownfield? Don't worry, I will explain you what exactly is greenfield and what exactly is brownfield project. Anyways, okay, so greenfield project is basically a new project, a project which is totally new. You have to set up your own team. There is no code base as such. From scratch, you have to build. On the other hand, brownfield projects are basically projects which may have some existing baggage. There was already a team working on it. There was already a source code for that project already in place. The environments were already there. Brownfield means you are just converting an existing project into DevOps. And greenfield means you are starting a new fresh environment and a project. Brownfield project, depending upon the individual project component, may be good or bad as a DevOps pilot project. Now, in what scenarios it could be good? Many a times, many a time it might happen that you are saying you are still some DevOps components in use. Like for example, let's say you have a project where you are already having a Git repository of your project source code. Right? So it's already set. Also, for the deployment aspect, your operations team is already using some kind of automation to set up and tear down the environment. So some part of DevOps might already be there. You just have to put missing one. In Greenfield project, on the other hand, you have to start afresh. It depends on the nature of project. Sometimes a brownfield project can be easier than greenfield because some of the things already exist and you just have to continue using them. On the other hand, greenfield, it's always the same. You have to start afresh. OK. Now, so these are the differences there. Any question about greenfield and brownfield project? These are generic concept, by the way. Hello.
Any question queries about Greenfield versus Brownfield? Okay, I guess there are no questions here. Let's proceed. Decide when to use system of record versus system of engagement. You can either keep system of record, which is static one. You will just mention what happened at what time. That's it. Okay. It emphasizes on accuracy and security. You can maintain lots of logs. You can maintain change log, for example. Like in the first release, we implemented these many features. In second release, we implemented little bit more extra features and so on. Change log you can maintain or application log. All that would be system of record. And then you can have system of engagement, which is more exploratory. You do, do you know there are lots of modern application monitoring tools that will monitor application and some of them even have a bit of AI, artificial intelligence. Think about a monitoring tool that can detect unusual, you can say, activities in your application. Let's say, for example, on an average, your resource consumption in your application goes up and down 10%, 10% less, 10% more. But then there is a time when suddenly the performance goes down, let's say more than 50% and then 60%, something like that, suspected operation. Or there are users, okay? There is a particular user who's trying to enter a password or who's trying to continuously use multiple ways to recover the password. Now, this could be an example of somebody trying to attack that particular account, right? So there are monitoring tools available who can identify the pattern and give you a right guidance, like what might be happening there. Please remember there are two types of monitoring now. The old style monitoring, you have to sit in front of a dashboard and look at those numbers and charts. And based on the values in front of you, you as a human have to make some decision. You, is, you are the one who will decide if everything is going, going good or every, something is going bad. Monitoring tool itself will just give you a report. Analysis, you have to do. Are you getting my point? Hello? Whereas there are now more robust system of engagement that allows you to provide more, you can say, detail analysis. There are even tools available that will use experiment. Have you done functional testing, anyone? Do you know there are open source tools that will allow you to do functional testing for your application? You can create a scenarios. Okay, like as a customer, I should be able to get list of product right should be able to search products some that kind of scenarios you can write a test case and ex explore them use experimentation right is there anybody here who has used functional testing anyone from qa hello Okay, fine. Identify groups to minimize the initial resistance. Whenever you are introducing a new technology or new product, there would be a little bit of resistance from people. Now we can have three categories of people. Last one, users are those who are afraid of using a new product which is still under testing or new product which nobody is using as of now. Let me give you an example. There are people who never use, I will take, I will give you an example of operating system. There is a newer version of your favorite operating system released by the vendor, but there are still some users who will say, no, we will not go and try that new operating system, which is already released. Let somebody else start, start using it. I will ask those other people experience their experience about the new product. <clears throat> and only then 
I will start using it. Those are users. OK, is that clear? Then there are early adapters. What are early adapters? Early adapters are one. As soon as a new product is released, they will go and purchase it and write their reviews so that other users like the third category user here. Right will get all the necessary information about that particular product. Those are early adapters. Then what are canaries then? If early adapters are one who will take the product as soon as it is released, right? Use it and help the other users to understand this product to decide whether or not to use it. Then who are canaries then? Anyone? Anyone? Canaries? Canaries are people who test product which is not yet over. Yes, that's right, Abhijit. There are people, canaries, who will be ready to actually use a product which is still not complete or which is still under testing, which is still not released for the end user, but they will go and Anyways, go and test the product. Those are canaries. Canaries get some time chance to test a product which may not actually come out and be available to end users and early adapters. Why canaries are required? Canaries are people who will actually give suggestion to the vendor whether this product will work or not. Now, if canaries say that this particular feature is of no use, right? Let's say a software developer is introducing four or five new features in their product. Canaries tell otherwise that these new features add no value. OK, then vendor might decide not to introduce them, not to release them for early adapters and users at all. So we have canaries, we have early adapters, and then we have users. Is that clear? OK, so there are three different types of users, so you have to identify type of users within your team. And whenever you are asking your team to migrate from, let's say, waterfall approach to agile or to migrate to DevOps, then identify canaries, people who are ready to test. The new things which nobody has used in organizations, identify canaries and early adapters. If you give a new product to end users, they will not be happy about it and they will keep complaining that older system was better. Right, they will still keep arguing that older system was better than this new system. Ideal target environment, your individual target, earlier target should be easily achievable. OK. Small enough to be achievable in reasonable time. And they should have benefits, obvious benefits to organization like Mean time to uh, fix the bug should be reduced. Amount of unplanned work is reduced, something like that. You should have clear goals there. These are the KPIs. DevOps, why do people implement DevOps? Because they want faster outcome, deployment frequency increased, deployment speed, deployment size, etc. Efficiency, server to admin ratio. Few people able to manage multiple servers, staff members to customer ratio, application usage and application performance, etc. can be improved by implementing DevOps. Quality and security. When organization goes for DevOps, they are planning to improve deployment failure rate, reduce deployment failure rate, reduce application failure rate, reduce mean time to recovery, MTTR. Anyways, can anybody here explain me what is MTTR, mean time to recovery? Anyone?
okay main time to recovery what it really mean is how fast your system can recover from bugs from errors and from defects if your main time to recovery is less okay that means your application is automatic uh, your application can be fixed faster yes how much time fix or functionality can be restored yes that's right abhijit that's right what the, this is what mttr means remember one thing you cannot say that my product is 100% safe for all kind of bugs and defects you can't comment something like that whenever software product organizations give a quality report about their product right we call them sla service level agreement a service level agreement will never say 100% you must have seen it right a service level agreement or sla could be 99.95% 99.99% or it could be even extreme 99.99 99.999 there is still a small chance that some will something will go down what mttr will ensure if something goes down we can go and fix it quickly is that clear yeah bug report rate test pass rate defect escape rate what is defect escape rate when you did internal testing there were no defects but when application was put into production environment there you got the defect this is called defect escape means you were supposed to catch all the defect in the testing phase but in testing phase you did not catch any of the defect but later you caught them later when it went to production this is called defect escape rate okay availability application availability sla achievement and mean time to detection now what is mean time to detection it is even more important than mean time to recovery mttd what is mean time to detection let me give you example of two different products there is a product when whenever there is a bug end users start getting errors or end users detect the bug and inform the development team the product owner that there is a bug found please fix it and then they wait for the fix that is application 1 product 1 then there is another product yes there is an internal team who found the defect even before most of the end users were uh, affected by it and immediately start working on it let's say you are an end user of second product where suddenly you got a pop up saying that we found a defect in so and so functionality and we are working to fix it right and it will take so and so time this is called proactive work don't wait for your end user to raise a query that something is not working in an application am i right that's called that this is related to mean time to detection mean time to detection means on an average how much time does it take for your application and monitoring tool to found a defect and to found a bug you found it and you immediately started working on it please remember if mean time to detection is high then mean time to recovery will also become too high because recovery will start only after you detect the defect is that clear hello understood how they are related mttr and mttd you cannot start recovery unless you detect what exactly is the problem or what exactly is the concern next point is about culture employee morale and retention rate that's the cultural aspect of devops how does it matter employee retention rate how can be associated with devops or not devops moving to a new technology how it is related to employee retention anyone
in it industry everyone is moving for or everyone is looking for two types of growth factor organizational growth and individual growth by moving to a newer technology or moving to an emerging technology moving to a most demanding technology product right will actually encourage both organizational growth and individual growth you can reduce or you can improve the employee retention rate people will stay because there are new features there are new product there are new technologies are being used okay you will always find people in every organization people like this they will always give an excuse i am going to leave my job but right now we are working on so and so product so and so project so i will stay right once it is done i will switch something like that there should be a technological growth okay or you can say skill growth or upskilling of employees will ensure that you will be able to retain them and it will also boost employee morale that yes we are using a new product a new technology in here any question so far let us then discuss team structure if you have any questions please post it now describe a team structure there are two different team structures here on my screen horizontal team and vertical team and i have a question for you which type of team structure your organization or your team is currently using are you part of horizontal team right now or a vertical team okay so abhijit has mentioned mainly horizontal yes okay horizontal team structure is an older team structure used mostly in two tier three tier or monolith applications where you will have one team who will build the user interface another team who will be working on database yet another team who will build the back end or service tier that is horizontal team structure if you are working on microservices you cannot use horizontal structure for microservices you should use vertical structure in vertical structure you will have one team working on one microservice and that one single team should have a developer who will build ui a developer who will build backend service and developer who will take care of data layer all of that in one single team by the way if you ask me about my personal opinion i actually realized that many organizations are actually using a hybrid team structure a hybrid team structure where they have user interface as a dedicated application okay so let's say for example ui or front end application has a dedicated team and they are horizontal all the people in this particular project are ui expert ui ux expert you front end application developers but back end back end would be an api rest api which is further broken down into individual microservices so there could be several microservices here behind the back end microservice 1 to microservice number 100 there are hundreds of microservices here now every microservice here will have dedicated vertical team but this time vertical team except ui developer there will not be any ui developer here in the backend team why 
because backend is basically an API. There is no need of UI expert here. But yes, you will have rest of the people in the team. Okay. Did you get the point? Hello. To give you an example, if you use Facebook, Facebook.com is just a front end application. Behind the scene, the front end application is using consuming lots of services, lots of microservices. But Facebook.com is only a single front end application that interacts with back end APIs. Individual API developer do not have to worry about UI. You know why? Because their APIs are consumed not by just the website, but also by Facebook mobile application. That too, there is a different application for Android and different application for iPhone. You must be aware of that, right? And all those front end applications use common set of back end API. So they don't have any UI developer or there is no UI included here. But yes, a vertical team could be a team that covers everything. Now here, just to clarify, clarify Email, voice, and TV are number of features. And here in horizontal, there is a team who will build UI for all the features. And here, it would be based on a feature. There is a team who will implement a feature called email, and that includes UI for email, service logic for email, and data for email. Is that clear? Any question about horizontal and vertical team structures? Okay, so I I got I guess there are no questions here on this. Fine. Let's move next. So, explore the ideal DevOps team. There should be uh, team members who are self motivated who should think that there is a change required, and they are having an ability to innovate on their own and explore the newer uh, technology and product. Many teams always hire external agile coach or mentors that will guide the team on correct implementation of agile methodology. Those agile coaches can be either trainers or consultant or both. Some coaches are technical expert. Please remember an agile coach need not be a technical expert. It might be possible that there is an agile coach in your project who is guiding the agile methodology but he has no knowledge on, let's say, .NET development. Just an example. In that case, your coach will only focus on the agile methodology and not the actual code. Please remember, agile coaches, by definition, are supposed to focus only on the agile process, not inside your code. You don't need, you don't expect your agile coach to fix null pointer exception for you. Agile coaches are not for that, but there are agile coaches who are technical expert and you know, exceptionally, you may find an agile coach guiding your development team with writing correct code or better code, but it's not a mandatory requirement from them. Now, collaboration is one important aspect of DevOps. So whenever you are following a DevOps, you have to have a proper collaboration or communication between team members. If we look at the more cultural changes, there should be more open workspaces, proper meeting etiquettes, outsourcing, and better communication between them. You can use tools, 
for better collaboration and communication like slack microsoft teams asana glip and jira are collaboration tools that help team to collaborate with each other communicate with each other you could also use tools like physical board uh, kanban board here i'm talking about or you can use software based tools like azure board for managing your project now what kind of devops tools we should choose as far as azure devops is concerned azure devops gives you these many tools as a part of azure devops subscription so as soon as you get the azure devops subscription you get these features first one is azure board which actually help you in agile planning work item tracking visualization and reporting it is basically for managing your project then you have as your pipeline which basically provides you a ci cd platform which is cloud agnostic and language neutral that means you should be able to build and deploy any kind of application using this platform java application dot net application golang application php application you name it and as your pipeline have it already you can also build and deploy container images or containers as your repos on the other hand is a repository hosting provider where you can create your own remote git repository and host your source code in azure repos by the way azure repos by the way have one more option instead of git you can also use tfvc team foundation version control which is another version control system azure repo provide as of now microsoft azure or azure devops recommend git repositories only fourth component that we have is azure artifact which actually allows you to integrate it with package management system like maven npm python nuget etc so that your developers will download dependency from azure artifact and not from maven central or nuget repository on internet okay and then fifth one test plan integrated testing environment any questions anyone based on these five services okay then let us discuss some of the features here another platform another platform from microsoft devops platform platform from microsoft is github github is a very popular open source platform microsoft uh, purchased github somewhere in year 199 uh, sorry 2019 or 2020 what are the features available on github platform github has git repositories a cloud hosted <coughs> git repositories with both public and private visibility we have or github provide unlimited public and private repositories for all its subscription users free users also paid users it has another interesting feature called code spaces which provides a cloud hosted or on cloud development environment so you don't have to actually install any kind of ide development environment on your local machine no you can do the development right from the browser and code spaces will give you everything the required dependency management tool language runtime build tool and everything you don't even have to install git in your machine if you use code space your development will happen directly on cloud 
Then we have GitHub Action, which is similar to Azure Pipeline. It is used for automation workflows with environment variable and customized script. It's written in YAML, by the way, YAML. GitHub Packages, just like Azure Artifact, you can build and package your application on GitHub Packages and later use those GitHub Packages for the deployment. And finally, security tool. This is one of the unique selling point of GitHub. There is a built in security tools in GitHub. You do not have to depend on external tool like Sonar Cube. OK, there is already a built in tool available from GitHub. GitHub Dependa Bot, for example. GitHub Core QL can be used instead of external tool. Any question about GitHub, by the way? Anyone? OK, then. If you use Azure DevOps, we will we will uh, use Azure DevOps only now. Azure DevOps actually is available in two different format. You can either use Azure DevOps server, which is on premise software, or you can use Azure DevOps service, which is a cloud SaaS platform software as a service. Which one do you prefer? Azure DevOps installed on premise or Azure DevOps cloud service? Yes, Samita, Vivek, Rohit. OK, Abhijit has mentioned cloud service. Vivek has also mentioned cloud. Yeah, cloud service because it's very easy to get started with it. On premise version of Azure DevOps requires a proper installation. And you need a system administration team who will take care of the installation and even maintenance of Azure DevOps server. Do you know Azure DevOps is actually just a rebranded name? The older product used to be called as TFS, Team Foundation Server. Microsoft rebranded it with a new name, Azure DevOps Server. OK. Now. In order to sign up for the cloud based service, what you just need to do is you need to have either a Microsoft account as your Active Directory account or any other social identity like Gmail, for example. If you have a Microsoft account, it could be a personal Microsoft account like your name at the rate hotmail.com, your name at the rate outlook.com, so on. Those are personal account or you could use Active Directory account or your work account, work account like XYZ at the rate synergeticsindia.com. Now that would be considered as work account or as your Active Directory account. So you can actually sign up and try Azure DevOps or sign up for Azure DevOps using either your personal or your work account. I would recommend you use personal account only. Azure DevOps can be integrated with lots of third party tools like Git, Doget, Xcode. There, you don't have to authenticate yourself with your username and password. For these type of external tools, Microsoft prefer use of personal access token, PATs, which will act like a password, but not for end user, but for these external tools. Have you used personal access tokens anywhere? How many of you have used personal access token? It's the generic concept. It's found outside Azure DevOps also. For Git, OK, good. Benefit of using personal access token is you don't have to reveal your user ID and password to anyone. 
Is that clear? So let's say you have created as your repository. OK, and one of your developer says that can you just give me your username and password so that I should be able to pull and push source code from my local repository to this remote repository. Now you don't have to share your user ID and password with that developer. Instead, you can just share personal access token. Now that personal access token can be used only for a particular service. Nobody can use personal access token to log in as a user in dev.azure.com. Is that clear? Personal access tokens are not for human users. They are for external tools and services. Azure DevOps is already pre-configured with default security group and permissions. So default security policy is already in there. In case if you want to modify it, you can go ahead and modify the default existing policy. You can add new rules, for example. For application also, you can configure the application access policies and conditional access policies. What is conditional access policies? Can you give anyone an example? Anyone? Temporary password, guest login. Uh, no, not necessarily. OK, I will explain. Conditional access policy is like this. If you log in from a known machine, or if you log in from a machine which is already registered with Active Directory, right? known device or authorized device, then you may or may not have to even enter a password. Just open the application and start using it, passwordless authentication. But if you try to log in from unknown device, then it will not just ask you for username and password, but it will also send you an OTP on your message and ask you to verify it further. That is conditional access. Is that clear? OK. Now, how about let's say there are people who are using already some kind of tool for agile project planning. Let's say your team is already using Trello or your team is already using Atlassian Jira for project management. Is it possible to import your agile project from these external tools to Azure board? Answer is yes. There is an extension available in Azure board. I will show you where you can find it. Microsoft Azure DevOps has some type of ma marketplace for itself. Let's go to the Azure DevOps marketplace. This is Azure DevOps marketplace and here in Azure DevOps marketplace, you will find necessary extensions that will allow you to migrate your project from, let's say, Trilio. I guess I made a spelling mistake. What is the correct spelling? Trilio, sorry. Yeah, here it is. There is already an extension here to integrate Trello with Microsoft Azure DevOps. Or if it is Jira, then there is an extension called Solidify. OK. That can migrate application from Jira to Azure DevOps. So there is a marketplace with lots of extensions already available to download. OK. Moving up ahead to the testing. These are the common testing tools. Apache JMeter, Pester, and SOAP UI. Now, have you used any one of these tools, by the way, for testing application? Anyone? OK, 
these are basically used by QA people, quality quality assurance or testing people. SOAP UI is used for SOAP and REST web services. Prester is used for testing PowerShell script, and JMeter is a load and uh, load uh, load and stress testing tool. Now about the license, there are two license po policies available for Azure DevOps. You can get Azure DevOps license or you can get Azure DevOps server license. What would be the difference here? Let me show you the pricing page. Here it is. Azure DevOps is available as a service and it is available as a service uh, server. OK, this is Azure DevOps service, the cloud one, and you can check the cost. Like, for example, these are the services available under basic plan. Basic plan, you will get free basic plan for up to five users. And for additional users, there would be a cost 495.43 rupees per new user per month. Less than five users, it's free. And this is what you will get under free. You will get as your pipeline, you will get as your board, repo and artifact. For artifact, free users will get only 2 GB space. Can you go to this URL and explore it a bit? And one more small uh, uh, important notice for all of you. You can see it on your chat window. OK, Samita has mentioned. Activation URL for Microsoft as your DevOps at course achievement batch. What you can do is. Log into Microsoft Learn. Using your existing Microsoft Learn account. If you don't have Microsoft Learn account, you can just Log in into Microsoft.com slash learn with your existing personal ID and it will create a profile. And then go to this URL and click on redeem button and follow the process. Uh, for this particular session, your redeem code is RDL57X. You don't have to type it, it will actually come pre uh, embedded into the text field. Just have to click on OK button. So I want you to actually go there and redeem your course batch now. OK. Let's see Vivek has already done this. He has also shared the screenshot. These are the achievements. OK, good. So others also I will recommend you guys to just go to the URL and uh, get the achievement badge. OK, I'm giving you guys five minutes to uh, get the batch. OK.
Okay, great. So if you have redeemed the batch, uh, you can put the screenshot here in a chat window. Okay. If you are stuck somewhere while uh, activating the batch, you can just put your query on the chat window here. Okay, I'll wait another one or two minutes. Okay, now. Once you uh, log in into this. Uh, Microsoft Learn profile. You will be able to explore all your current patches if you have any, and it will also give you access to the entire learning modules for Azure DevOps. I will show you where you can access all the self learning material. So what you can just do is. On Microsoft Learn homepage itself. Search for the module. AZ 400. Like this. And it will take you to this. Azure DevOps. Wait a second, we are looking for. As your DevOps. Get started DevOps transformation journey. This is the module we are doing right now. Are you getting my point? And the other modules are here. As I told you, there is a dedicated module on infrastructure as a code using Azure and DSC. Can you see that? These are the learning path within AZ 400. OK, for every individual folder. Uh, sorry, for every individual uh, module, there is a separate learning path available here. You can see all the learning path here. This is the first, this is the second, this is the third, fourth, and so on. All the nine learning path right here on Microsoft Learn Portal. So whatever I am explaining to you right now with the help of this presentation, all that information is included already in Microsoft Learn Portal. OK. Now. So Azure DevOps provides service 
the cloud server, cloud service and the on-premise service. Now, any idea why people will go with on-premise version instead of cloud? Do you see any benefit of using on-premise installation of Azure DevOps server instead of using cloud hosted Azure DevOps service? Yes, Abhijit, you are right. So basically, when you use Azure DevOps cloud service, you are just the end user. All the controls are with vendor Microsoft. Security is all taken care of by Microsoft. But if you want little bit controls in your hands as well, then you will go with Azure DevOps server, the on-premise installation. For domains like banking and finance, this becomes a statutory requirement. Do you know that there are some policies, okay, data policies, which do not allow you to keep your application code or data on a third party vendor's location. Either your data and code must be with your machines, your on-premise servers, or your clients, customers server. It cannot be third party server. Are you getting my point? Hello? It's like that, that kind of requirements. So you will be able to run everything within your own physical infrastructure and you can keep it disconnected from Internet as well for additional security and safety. You can run it totally in deep disconnected environment. A local network is there, machines are connected to each other, but no connectivity with Internet and you will be still able to run it properly there. You will get control, con complete control over security. You can modify it as per your requirements. OK, and you will be responsible for the safety and security and maintenance of your Azure DevOps server as well. OK. Similarly, even GitHub has a cloud service and on premise GitHub Enterprise server that you can install in your own local machine. Now. Any questions so far? Are you able to? create the batch or are you able to uh, follow the process and get the Azure DevOps batch? Okay, then let's go with the next sub module, which is project planning, agile project planning with Azure board and GitHub. We'll not do the GitHub part. We will just look at the Azure board part. But before that, let me show you how to sign up on how to sign in into Azure DevOps. Signing in into Azure DevOps is easy. Go to dev.azure.com, press enter, and it will take you to your dev.azure.com portal, Azure DevOps portal. Now, if it is first time you're visiting dev.azure.com, you might get redirected to a sign up page where you have to log in with your Microsoft account, personal or office account, and create your free subscription. Okay. Later on, you will get a screen like this. You will notice I already have a couple of projects inside my current Azure DevOps account. Did you notice that? Hello? All of these are my Azure DevOps service project. OK. To show you an example, this is a parts unlimited project. And for this parts unlimited project, you will notice on the left hand side, there is Azure board. Azure repo, Azure pipeline, and in Azure board, this is the current work item book, or you can say this is my current product backlog. Do you know what is product backlog? Anyone? It's a term very commonly used in agile methodology. Product backlog. Product backlog is basically just a collection of features to be implemented or tasks to be executed. You can you have the option here to check the entire backlog and here it is parts team backlog. This is the backlog. Here you will notice for every item in the backlog, there are few items which are marked as feature. There are few items marked as user story and there are few items which are marked as bug. Can you see there are two bugs here? 
bug number one, bug number two, and these are all user stories. User stories are basically items which begin with as a so and so user, I should be able to do so and so. This is actually to introduce a new functionality. OK, this is basically will be tra translated into a new feature. So this is going to be a new feature that you need to add to your particular product. Now, every feature or every user story will have one or more task assigned to it. Right, and not just that you can add or you can provide some description about it. You can provide the acceptance criteria like when it will be actually accepted and you can provide some other discussion items here. Great thing here is team members can collaborate right here through the discussion panel. Here people one person can communicate with another person like they can have a simple communication between themselves, a debate between themselves, right? You can even specify whom you want to talk. Put the at the right symbol and then specify the name of person and then write down the note for that person. Are you sure this feature is needed in Sprint 2? Let's say I wrote a comment and I save this here. So one user is sending a comment or mentioned a comment about a feature. Other person can go back there and reply to it. And what is great thing basically? Let's go to hotmail.com. Oh wait, it's actually getting my Mahindra Unlimited ID. I need a different one. The other ID. It will be converted into an email and the other user will receive an email in their inbox that somebody has mentioned your name and they want you to answer this like that. This type of collaboration is included in here. What was the ID? Mahindra hyphen Shinde. At the rate hotmail.com. Oh, wait. I just lost the password. Wait, wait, wait. This should be already here. I can just use this single use code or OTP basically to log in in that account. Here I am. Continue. Let's see if there is a mail sent by Azure board. Whenever you create a new feature or task, you can specify whom you want to assign it. So this is state. This is unassigned. You can assign it to the user and then save and close. Let's see what happens to the inbox. Can you see this? Hello? Hello? So basically, you don't have to communicate directly over a mail. You just mention that and appropriate email notifications will also be sent. OK, so this is the product backlog. Now let me explain you your few concepts in here. A work item if you want to add could be either a feature or a bug. Can you see that? Either you are adding a new feature or you are adding a new bug. If it is a bug, you have to provide the description about the bug. Right? If it is a feature, you have to provide the description for the feature and then you can do a planning. Where do you want to keep this? Do you want this bug to be fixed in Sprint 2 or Sprint 3 or Sprint 4? And guess what? It allows drag and drop. You can drag it and drop it here. You know what does it mean? I want this to be actually taken care of in Sprint 3. Is that here? If I go to Sprint 3, 
you will notice this bug is now added here. Can you see that? Hello? This way, you will be able to track all kind of work that is happening on your project. You have multiple sprint like now this one is let's say a current sprint and inside this current sprint people will be working on these two features. Is that clear? The sprint is of 10 days, June 3 to June 24. Yes. Right, right now I'm in sprint two. Let's see what was there in sprint one. This was the concept in strip, uh, uh, sprint one and this is already implemented. And who implemented it? Craig. Can you see the detail? Hello. This is just a sample project which I have. There are a lot many product items, backlog items in here. And if you go back to Azure board, there are multiple different views available. Let's say, for example, I want to see a Kanban board. Now, this is a Kanban implementation of this Azure board. You will see the, the, the columns here. These are the new items. These are the items in design, doing and done, develop and test, doing and done, and then final done. Can you see the number of columns in here? You in one single glance, you will be able to notice what features are currently under development, what features are done, and what are pending. Is that clear? Any question about Azure board? Let me check if my project is public or private. Looks like this public is uh, this project is private project. I believe I do have some project which is public marked as public. OK, this is also private project. I can do one thing, by the way, I can make a particular project as a public project so that you will be able to see my project and all the details, at least the board, right, without any login or without any sign in. I'm sharing a URL with all of you. Just try to visit this URL and check if you can see my Azure board or get the details of my Azure project. Can you do that? I have shared a link with you. This link will allow you to explore my project without any login. But then the access would be limited. You won't be able to see my entire product backlog. You can see not all type of boards are available here. Only the backlog you can see. You can only check the product backlog, nothing more. Just visit the link and check yourself. Any questions? Are you able to visit this URL and get the project? You don't even have to sign up for Azure DevOps to be able to use this link. OK, great. So these tool as your board GitHub board basically allows you to plan your entire agile project. Track the issues, work items, defect, etc. Assign the work to users and get it done. You can even link your GitHub projects to Azure board using a plugin. You can also manage work with GitHub project, which I'm not explaining you now. For GitHub project, you have to create an account on GitHub. If you already have a GitHub account, you can create a GitHub project for free. 
all free GitHub account users also get this feature called GitHub project. You will get a view like this. Now this is a view from GitHub. OK, these are all the pending items, or this is basically your product backlog. This is how it will look in GitHub. You can also integrate it with Microsoft Teams so that instead of communicating over an email, you will be able to communicate with your team on Microsoft Teams channel. You can post messages on channel instead of sending emails to them. And this can be integrated with GitHub. There is a plugin available called Octo Team. Sorry, Octo Team is actually a sample team, not the plugin. Any question about Azure board? No. If you have any questions, please post them because now we will be moving to the final module for today, uh, which is source control. That's it, and then we will wind up the session. Any questions, anyone? OK, then now source control is easy. Some of you might have already used source control system, Git version control system. Source control is very essential part of DevOps or overall project development, and it is used in multiple stages in DevOps. Some people use source control system even for uh, the application templates or uh, I, uh, uh, the template or document that describe the entire environment. They also use it, of course, for automated test cases. You can keep your test cases, your source code, and even your environment information, how to spin up the environment. Everything could be sto stored in Git repository itself. A source control, what is basically benefit of keeping all that in a source control? Please remember a very basic behavior of source control system is to keep multiple versions of the same file. So if you want to go back and check what was the content of this file 10 days back, you should be able to do that if you have version control system in place. So for every file, all the changes or entire change history can be retrieved when you have source control. A typical source control system allows you to have multiple version of the same code, same file at the same time. If you want all of them to be accessible at the same time, you can use a feature called branches. You could create a branch. OK. Version control system save the snapshot of your file so that you can review and if required, roll back any version of your code with ease. So easily you should be able to revert back to the older version of the same code. They will also protect your code from catastrophe and casual degradation of human error. So. You should have access to all that history and you should be able to recover it in case of disaster. By the way, Git has one interesting concept. Git is distributed version control system. That means there will be a local repository and then there will be a remote repository, two versions of it. Now, what is benefit of source control in DevOps? A typical DevOps workflow, CI/CD, depends on Git or depends on version control system. 
can you see the diagram on my screen right now hello yeah diagram on my screen here is actually trying to explain you continuous integration delivery and deployment in one single image so let's try to understand what it is the very first thing here in this automated workflow is version control system version control system is where developers will make all the code changes and as soon as developer make the change it goes for the build now you can see there is a small control placed over here either somebody has to turn the wheel manually or it could be automatic so it could be a manually triggered or it could be an auto triggered so what happens after version control system is modified a new version is made and somebody triggered this trigger what will happen first it will go to the remote repository and download all the dependencies or packages and then try to build the application if you get any error the errors will be reported to team of developers who are supposed to make changes to the source control system again to fix the error and then again go and try to build it let's assume this time it was able to build successfully so what is the next step run the unit test case if any of the unit test case fail send the feedback back to the developer and make them change the source code save and commit it to version control and again execute it till then let's assume on your second attempt you fixed all the unit test errors so what will happen now build unit test and now deploy at the time of deployment if deployment is successful it will go for qa or otherwise it will send a response back to developer can you see the workflow entirely now hello so at every stage if something doesn't work a feedback has to be sent back to developer and developers are supposed to fix the things on their source control system as soon as they fix it on source control build unit test deploy all the stages will rerun and this will all happen till production deployment once you goes to production then you just have to measure and validate means run the monitoring tool any question about this entire workflow anyone any questions about this workflow okay these are some of the best practices if you are using source control always make smaller changes never commit a personal file which should not be there in your source code update very often and write before pushing to avoid merge conflict anybody here heard about merge conflict vivek this is part of the best practice history changes history changes are recorded and they are immutable so whenever you make the changes make sure that before you make new changes verify whether you have committed the old changes with a proper commit message so make a habit of using a command like git status which will remind you if you have not done any commit or you have changes which are not yet committed every time you do any commit you have to first run the update or download the update do you know in git there is a command call uh, git pull do you know what git pull command does it will download the latest update of repository remote repository into your local repository so do that very often that way you will be able to avoid the merge conflict every time you are pushing your changes to remote repository first verify whether it is able to compile and you are able to run the unit test in locally on your local machine before you push it to remote repository also pay attention to commit messages commit message should actually give an idea 
to an end user or whoever is looking at the commit on commit history what exactly the changes made if possible every commit you can link it with the work item like you were working on feature number 1 2 3 4 so mention that in the commit no matter what is your background or preference be a team player and follow the agreed conventions and workflows now what is that what is the tool and what is the process your team follows use the same process do not try to force your best practices on others this is what this point is to, uh, trying to tell you about is that clear hello these are the two types of source control system centralized and decentralized centralized are svn tfvc and cf cvs is there anybody here who has worked with svn or any other centralized version control system hello tfs rohit okay good it's not tfs actually it's tfvc team foundation version control system okay tfs is the name of product which contains tfvc anyway so it's a centrally centrally stored that means all the history changes are stored on a central machine and when an individual developer connects to tfvc repository he or she will get only the latest updated changes on their local machine and not the complete history on the other hand git will have complete history now centralized system is very scalable it's because all your code base is on the central machine and if you want to scale it up just provide more storage to that central machine that's how you can scale it you can have granular permission control you can specify a particular file to be read only to set up users you can do that permit monitoring of usage you can permit or you can allow individual users to monitor the overall resource usage on this particular source control system like how much storage they are occupying for example and exclusive file locking you can lock a particular file for deletion and update what does it mean if it is deletion lock that means file can't be deleted and if it is update lock that means file cannot be modified is that clear okay so in case if you have large integrated core bases you have to audit the access level for every single file use centralized like svn the new modern type are distributed git and bazaar and mercurial these three are distributed number one they are cross platform git works on linux windows and mac they have open source code review model where a person who made the changes has to raise a pull request and notify other members to review his or her code and give their approval complete offline support you can work in git repository when even when you are not connected to internet in that case you will commit all the changes to your local repository to push the changes to remote repository you need internet connectivity but i guess you don't need it 24 by 7 you need it only when everything is finalized and you want to upload it now to the remote repository is that clear any question about centralized and decentralized or distributed version control system anyone so these are the differences between a centralized and a distributed version control system a point of reference or example uh, version control systems here git and tfvc
these are the benefits of Git, by the way. A lightweight branching model, distributed development where you can have a dedicated remote repository and its full clone in local repository. Concept of pull request for code review, open source community and release cycle. These are the benefits of Git version control system. You will get this benefit in both Azure Repo Git and GitHub Git and even Bitbucket. These are some of the objections or limitations of using Git. Let's see them all. Overwriting a history. It is very much possible that you might overwrite the history or modify the history in Git. Now, please remember by definition version control system, history should be immutable. You should not be able to change the history, but Git actually allows you to modify the history and there are actually multiple ways you can do it. You can do that with the help of rebase command, for example, right? Or you can do that by merging the request. Git earlier had no support for large file, but now support is provided using an extension called Git LFS. Learning curve. You might have to take a lot of time to learn Git. Okay, you will have to learn how to make uh, how to manage files in Git local repository, how to sync them with remote repository, how to make use of merge. OK, branches and merging the branches, how to avoid or resolve the merge conflict, how to use merge request or pull request and so on. So there is a steep learning curve. And basically, if your team has already used centralized version control system like SVN, it will take a little bit more time for them to adapt Git. Because a very common question they might keep asking you is we used to do so and so activity in SVN using so and so command. Now give us an alternative in Git. Yes, that's the most common. Any question for us so far about the version control system? Let me show you an example. For the same project that I was showing you earlier, Parts Unlimited, this is where the repository is, repo, and this is a Git repository. You will notice inside this Git repository, this is the source code, Parts Unlimited ASP.NET code. You can see the commit history here. These are the number of commits that has happened on this repository. You can see when the date and time when the commits actually were created. Can you see that? Hello. You can even see the list of branches. How many branches you have? These are all the branches here. And you will even see who created this branch. There is even a separate branch for performance and load testing. Let's see what is extra in here in this branch. And guess what? There is a separate subfolder inside this branch for test. And do we have any kind of script inside it? Looks like yes. There is a PowerShell script inside it. Can you see that? Oh, looks like it is just a copy command. Copying the file in target directory. And looks like there are Selenium test cases already written for this project. Did you notice that? So different branches can have slightly different part of code included in this. Any question about Git? Now, for the hands-on part, best thing about Azure DevOps is there are lots of hands-on demos already available. If you go to this URL, azuredevopslabs.com, there are lots of DevOps labs already available here. Okay, like there is a lab who will show you 
or teach you how to deploy it to Kubernetes cluster, how to use YAML pipeline, how to integrate it with Terraform, okay, and how to integrate it with Ansible. Let me share the URL with you. But remember, these labs simply assume that you know how to use Azure DevOps. Is that clear? All these labs have their own source code and even on kind of templates already created. OK, you don't have to write everything from scratch, by the way. Can you please visit this URL and see how many labs are visible there? OK. Yeah, so there are quite few hands on labs available there. I hope you are all able to explore it, explore them, uh, different types of labs which are available. OK. And for Microsoft Learn, if you go to MicrosoftLearn.com, you will find learning path. All the modules are right there for the self study. And once you have done the study, you can try. Some of the labs on your own. Many of the labs will actually give you a detailed steps with screenshot and everything like this is a lab on Azure board. For example, in this lab you will be logging into Azure DevOps account. Then you will go to the project setting, go to the team, create a team. You can see the steps here. Create a new iterations like Sprint 1, Sprint 2, Sprint 3 and so on. And then you can add work items into it. This is where they have given an example like you have epics. You have features, then under features you have stories and under user stories you have tasks like that. So that they have given quite good screenshot and detailed explanation on how to carry out all these activities. Did you notice that? Hello? I have shared the URL for this Agile lab. Go and check the lab. And then we will wind up in a couple of minutes. OK, any question you have about DevOps, Azure DevOps or Azure DevOps certification exam? Any question about that? Any questions about uh, certification? AZ 400? OK, then. Uh, don't forget to share your uh, feedback about the session. Uh, the link has been uh, shared with you in the message window here.
Yes. Sure. So we will wind it up here. You have any questions or queries, you can still post it now. Yeah, you're welcome. Please do yep. share your feedbacks um, before you leave the session. Okay, guys, have a good day. Thank you, sir, and thank you all for participating in this webinar. And please don't forget to fill your feedback forms before you leave the session. Thank you.